Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew. Tonight we're going to bid farewell to an old friend. We're concluding our series in the Sermon on the Mount. The series is entitled Christian Counterculture. Jesus has called us to be different from the world. We're to be separate, but not isolated. Now tonight, we're going to look at the final passage. Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to begin in verses 24 and read down to verse 29. Here's the word of the Lord. Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority, and not as their scribes. May God bless the reading of his word tonight. When I was in India, I guess it's been about eight or nine years now, serving as a summer missionary, they did something over there that I'd never seen before. Before I went to India, I was really not familiar with the terms cornerstone or capstone. Are y'all familiar with those terms? We don't hear a lot about those architectural terms in our day and time. The cornerstone is like the foundation stone. It's the first part of a building or a construction project. The capstone is the final part. It caps off the building project, if you will. When I was in India, when they would commence a building project, commence any type of building, they would lay a cornerstone and there would be an elaborate celebration as they thought about the beginning of this immense work. And then when the work was over and they set the capstone, they had another elaborate celebration to celebrate its completion. Well, tonight we're thinking about the capstone of the Sermon on the Mount. The cornerstone was the Beatitudes. That's how Jesus starts this greatest sermon ever preached. But then tonight we read the final passage. Jesus lays the capstone. He ends the sermon. And He ends it with a unique way. It is a call to decision. A call to act on what He's just told them. The King has issued His decrees. He's given His proclamation. And now it calls upon the people to decide. Will they be his subjects or will they be rebels? He sets before them what I call two ways. A way of life and a way of death. As I was studying this passage and preparing this message, I couldn't help but think about the similarity between how Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount and how Moses begins his conclusion of the book of Deuteronomy. Let me me read that passage. Don't turn there, just stay there. I want to read to you the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy means to say again or to rehearse. Moses cannot enter into the promised land because of his sin, but as a good leader, a good shepherd, he wants to prepare his people to be successful. So he goes over with them again the acts of God and the commandments that God has given them so they would be prosperous, be blessed in the promised land. In in chapters 28 and 29, he gives a series of curses and a series of blessings. If you disobey, if you do not walk in the ways of God, if you do not honor His commands, then an unbelievable curse will fall upon you, fall upon your family, and fall upon your land. If you honor God, If you obey His commands, if you walk in His ways, then tremendous blessing will be poured out upon you, upon your family, upon your land. 
Moses concludes that with these final verses in chapter 30. In chapter 30, verses 19 and 20, he says this, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying His voice, and by holding fast to Him. For this is your life and the length of your days, that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to give them. Doesn't that sound very similar to what Jesus does at the end of the Sermon on the Mount? Both of them are calling for action. Both of them are calling for decision. Two ways are being presented. A way of life, a way of death. Tonight, as we end this series on the Sermon on the Mount, I want us to look, to examine the two ways that Jesus gives. And then we're going to talk about making that decision. So let's look at this. Go back to that passage, our final passage, Matthew chapter 7. Let's look at the first way now. Way one, I call it the lifestyle of obedient action. The lifestyle of obedient action. Jesus was and is a master communicator. He's the great communicator before anybody ever heard of Ronald Reagan. As a great communicator, he's able to make the difficult simple and accessible. One of the techniques that Jesus used for doing that is a parable. A parable is a heavenly story with an earthly meaning. It's a common, everyday story that reveals a deeper spiritual truth. As Jesus demonstrates these two ways as He calls upon a decision from the hearers and from us tonight, He communicates this truth by way of a parable. He presents two hypothetical situations that all of us here would have been familiar with. A construction program. Building a house and laying a foundation. He talks about two different foundations to compare responding to life or responding to death. In the first part of this parable in verses 24 to 25, he issues this parable and then he gives us the application. He speaks of a man who builds a home and he lays a solid, sturdy foundation upon the rock. And then we don't have to guess as to its meaning, as to its application. He says, that's the wise person who listens to my words and actually does them, acts upon them, obeys them. I want us to probe the first part of this parable for a moment. I call it the lifestyle of obedient action. That is the first way that Jesus presents to us the way of being, the way of living I want us to probe that for a moment and think through that way and that lifestyle. First, I want to talk to you about the character of that lifestyle, the character of that one who listens to the words of Jesus and acts upon them. Look at verse 24 of our passage again, first part of the parable. I read it once, I'll read this verse again. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Jesus says, I've issued my proclamations. I've issued my decrees as king of the kingdom of heaven. Now you've got to decide. In light of everything I have said, it's time to decide and it's time to act. He says, those who hear His words and act upon them and follow them. They're that wise man who built his house on the rock. What is the character of that lifestyle? Of that one who acts upon, who lives the commands of Jesus? Look at verse 24. Very, very simple. What's the lifestyle? What's the character of them? First, they're a doer. Look what it says there in verse 24. Who hears these words of mine and acts upon them. Doesn't that sound simple? You hear what Jesus says and you do them. It sounds elementary. It sounds simple. But we're missing that today. Jesus tells us you can't have simple lip service to the Gospel. You have to have life service to the Gospel. And maybe you're thinking, well, Brother Randy, I get that. 
I know what you're saying. I don't think that we do understand that. In our area, the Bible Belt, there has been a perversion of the gospel. What I mean by that is that we emphasize one thing to the neglect of another. You know what we emphasize? We emphasize salvation by faith. And we should emphasize that. We should stress that. It's biblical. We're saved by God's grace through faith. Ephesians 2.8. We emphasize that and we should. But we're neglecting something else. We're neglecting what comes after salvation. We're neglecting the true meaning of salvation. You have been saved to serve. You've been saved for good works. If you look at Ephesians 2, 8, read the following verses. 9 and 10, you were created for good works. You can't emphasize one without the other. You can't pay mere lip service to the gospel you have to act. As James says, you can't be merely hearers of the Word, but you must be doers. As we think about that, that lifestyle of obedient action, one characteristic of it is uh, to, to act and to serve. But Jesus also tells us something else about those who hear and who act. He calls them wise. Look what He says at verse 24 again. They may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. You know what he's saying? He's saying, if you listen to me and you do what I tell you, that's wisdom on your part. Now, folks, we live in a time where people think that it's stupid to follow Jesus, do they not? They think it's folly. They think it's stupid. They think it's outdated. I heard that this week. In the morning when I, I get ready to come to the church, I usually uh, will put my iPad on while I'm, I'm shaving. And I'll listen to some conservative talk shows and news shows. And a journalist was interviewing Jesse Ventura. Do you remember Jesse Ventura, the former governor of Minnesota? Uh, more importantly, he's a wrestler. <laughs> Alan knows. Alan knows. I see him back there. Jesse Ventura. He made a comment when he was governor of Minnesota. He said that religion was for weak-minded people. Y'all remember that? It was a firestorm when he said it. Well, the journalist gave him the opportunity to clarify were you misquoted? Were you taken out of context? What did you mean by that statement? He said, I meant exactly what I said. I am an atheist. Religion is for weak-minded individuals. He said, I hate organized religion. It is the cause of all wars throughout history. In some ways, I agree with him. You know what? I'm not a fan of religion either. But Christianity is different from a religion. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's a big, big difference. We have to shut those voices out and listen to the voice of Christ. And what does He tell us? You hear me, you do my words, you're wise. That's the character of the lifestyle. Let's talk about something else now. We're thinking about that first way, the way of life, the lifestyle of obedient action. We've talked about the character. Let's talk about the comfort of the lifestyle now. Jesus not only tells us that uh, it's, it's uh, wise to do what He says, but He tells us that there's a great comfort to be gained by hearing Him, by following Him, by devoting our lives to what He tells us to do. Look at the second part of the parable. Look at verse 25. Again, He's talking about that wise person who built his house upon the rock, meaning somebody who hears Him and listens and follows and submits. What He says... The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and slammed against that house, yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. In the previous verses, he said, if you hear me, you follow, you're wise. Now, he says, as he adds more detail to that parable, if you hear me and you follow, not only are you wise, but you're going to enjoy comfort. You know what that means when he says the storms raged, the floods came, the winds howled and blew? What he means is, if you follow me and submit to me, you will endure. You will stand fast. There's comfort in that. Now, I know that when he gives this parable, he's speaking metaphorically. 
He's not talking about an actual storm, but as I, I read that this week and thought about it, we do face storms, don't we? And Jesus is the way that we endure. We're all different, different ages, different genders, different stages in life. But there's two storms that each of us are going to face. And if you follow Jesus, if you submit to His commands, you'll be able to endure and withstand them. One storm is the storms of life. We go through strife, turmoil, confusion. It's been said that we're either coming out of a storm or going into a storm. With Jesus, you can endure those storms of life. With Jesus, you can withstand them, overcome them, and in fact, you can even flourish in the midst of those storms, those storms of life. Another storm that every one of us is going to face. There's going to come a day when we face that storm in eternity. When our God scrutinizes us, looks at our lives, and only if you are in Christ, only if you've heard and followed Him, will you be able to stand on that day. Not only will you simply endure that storm, but in Christ you will escape that storm. Escape that wrath. There is comfort. I want to plead with you tonight to follow the first way to pursue that lifestyle of obedient action. Don't give mere lip service to the Gospel. Give life service to Jesus. Let me share with you the second way now. We've talked about way one, the lifestyle of obedient action. Now let's talk about the second way and look at the second part of the parable. Way two, I call it the lifestyle of disobedient inaction. Jesus has spoken in the first part of the parable in a positive sense. The one that hears and follows my word. That's the one who wisely builds the house upon a firm foundation upon the rock so that when the storms come, when the winds blow, when the floods rise, the house will remain. Now he speaks negatively in the second part of the parable. He speaks about the one who hears but does not follow. The one who listens but does not submit. And he says they build their house upon sand and it will come crashing down. Let's probe this part of the parable for a moment just like we did the first part. Let's think about this lifestyle of disobedient inaction. Let me tell you some things about it. First, I want to talk to you about the identity of the inactive. Who is Jesus addressing? When He speaks of that one who foolishly hears but does not follow, that one who would construct a house and not lay a foundation, not have a rock but sand, who is He talking about? Well, we can ascertain who He's talking about based upon one detail in this verse and in the context of the rest of the passage. Look at verse 26 again. Jesus says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Look at the first part of the verse. Everyone who hears these words of mine. Who hears the words of Jesus? Week in and week out. Who's heard that gospel message? Who's heard the decrees of the King constantly over and over again? Good, religious, moral folk. That's who he's talking about. We can not only tell that from verse 26, but look at the passage immediately before. Look at verses 21 and 23. I won't read all of them. But he speaks of that one who calls him Lord, Lord but does not follow, does not do the will of the Father in heaven. That's the one that He says, depart, I never knew you, you that practice lawlessness. He's talking about good, religious, moral folk. Those who know the truth. Those who might even give lip service to the truth. Who could give you the right answer. But their lives do not back it up. That's the identity of the inactive. The words of Jesus correspond with what we know to be true about the church today in our country. In one of the final interviews of Billy Graham, he said that he personally estimated that about two-thirds of people who are members of churches are lost. I was reading some statistics a couple of weeks ago as I was working on my 
major ministry project, a dissertation, and this group conducted a survey and they held that they believed that only two to five percent of people in the United States were practicing Christians. Practicing. Big difference. Two to five percent. Do you know what that tells us? The identity of the inactive. The identity of those who live with a sense of false security are your friends and your family members that are good, moral, religious folk. Isn't that scary? Isn't that sorrowful? The folk that we see on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights, the folk that we see on Wednesdays for that matter, are the very ones that Jesus is talking about. That should prompt us to two actions. One is self-examination. Are you right with God? I heard somebody say that Christianity in the South is like sweet tea. Everybody's got a little bit. Everybody knows a little something about Jesus. The question is, are you hearing and following? Are you hearing and doing? That's the distinction that Jesus made here and in other places. And that's what's going to make the eternal difference in your life. It should prompt us to self-examination. It should also prompt us to evangelize. If these folks around us are lost and living with a false sense of security, it's you and my responsibility to do something about it. We have to talk to them. Yes. We have to share with them. Or they're going to face eternity in hell. And that brings me to the next thing I want to talk about is we think of the identity of the disobedient of disobedient inaction. I want to talk to you about the outcome of the inactive. What's going to happen to these people? What's going to happen to those that hear and do not follow? Well, look at verse 27, the second part of the parable. The rain fell, the floods came, the wind blew and slammed against the house, and it fell in great was its fall. Now we know because it's a parable, Jesus is talking about a house, but He's talking about more than that. What He describes here is the cataclysm of final judgment. Think of how He describes it. He speaks of this house that just gets slammed and wiped out. We're not talking about minor storm damage. We're not talking about a few shingles in the yard that the wind has blown. We're talking about the whole structure crumbling, wiped clean. This is speaking of the final judgment of God against the lost. And he says they are going to face condemnation. <sighs> Wiped out. I fear that we read Jesus' parables so often and His sayings. We read them so much. They're so familiar to us that we lose their significance. We don't think about it. Think on that. Those that hear Him, that know the truth but don't act on it, one day they're going to be judged. And they're not going to stand. They are not going to make it. What's going to happen? Again, that's where you and I come in. We can make the difference and we've been called to make the difference. And that's by sharing the Gospel. Make sure you're right. Make sure your family and your friends are right before God. Now we've talked about the two ways, the way of life, the way of death, the lifestyle of obedient action, the lifestyle of disobedient inaction. Now I want to conclude everything. I want to tie it up by talking about a call to decide. This brings me to the third thing. I want to talk to you about the need to choose your way. You've got to decide for yourself. I can't decide for you. If I could, I would. You have to decide personally. I want you to read with me the final verses of the Sermon on the Mount. We've, Jesus has ended the sermon. He's concluded this parable. Now Matthew gives us a statement of the people's response. Listen to what we're told. 
When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at His teaching. For He was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Matthew gives us the response to the Sermon on the Mount and he talks how they responded in two ways. First, they responded with amazement. They were astonished at what Jesus had to say. There was wonderment. They were intrigued. Well, folks, we need to understand something. They might have been amazed, but that doesn't necessarily mean salvation. Being intrigued by the words of Christ, being intrigued by godly teaching does not equate salvation. I, I think of King Herod. He liked to listen to John the Baptist. He kept him around a long time, didn't he? But then he killed him. And he died lost. Amazement, intrigue with what Jesus has to say does not equal salvation. They were amazed. But then they also acknowledged. They acknowledged the authority of Jesus. It says there in verse 29, they acknowledged how different His teaching was from what they had heard. He taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. The scribes back then had deviated from the Word of God. Listening to a scribe back then was like listening to a legal brief. They spent more time quoting such and such rabbi and that rabbi in that school. They didn't go back to the Word. They didn't go back to the original intent as Jesus did. And so they lacked authority. The people picked up on that. But again, just because you acknowledge, hey, Jesus is speaking with authority, He certainly has some authority again, that does not equate salvation. I'll tell you this, in their response, we're told what they did. But what they didn't do is just as important. Oftentimes as we read Scripture, what the Scriptures are silent about, what they don't say as often is informative as what they do say. Tell me what your Bible says. My, my Bible does not say that when Jesus finished, people lined up, bowed the knee and gave their heart to Him and said, I'll follow your commands. Does your Bible say that? Mine doesn't say that. I'm going to step away from the pulpit as I say this. Why, why do you think that is? Because it didn't happen. See, there's a lot of people who are willing to hear and be amazed by the words of Jesus. Acknowledge that He has some authority. But the people who are willing to hear and act, hear and submit, hear and do, they're few and far between. What would we say around here? They're scarcer than hen's teeth? You don't find them. What does that mean for us tonight? You've got to choose your way. Jesus has issued His commands. He's laid it out. He said, it's time to decide. You've heard. Will you act? You've heard. Or will you rebel? You have life or you have death. Eternal security or lack thereof. You must decide. And I pray that you'll make the right decision. I'm going to close us in prayer right now. If you recognize that you are...